There we go. Okie dokie. Right, what are we doing today? Well, everyone's probably at college today, so I'm not expecting any viewers, but I just wanted to bang out a quick live on biological molecules, the last part of biological molecules for biology A-level, and that is to cover ATP, just checking the mic, uh, and inorganic ions. So let's go through. Um, the knowledge on inorganic ions in this section, as this is first year content, is quite brief. You just need to know for AQA, OCR and Edexcel, just a brief bit of information about a selection of different ions. Um, ATP, we're going to do in a little bit more detail at the start, but it's quite a quick lesson. At the end of today's lesson, there is a section that I'm going to do, which is only for about five or ten minutes, that is only relevant to people who are doing AQA. I'm going to cover what is called a synoptic, well, it's on the paper three synoptic paper, and it's a 25 mark essay, and to do with inorganic ions, as it's an essay that comes up every now and then um, in your final paper three. If you're an AQA student, it's worth 25 marks, and I'll be covering that at the end of this lesson. So if you're interested, you go ahead and skip to that if you're watching this on a rerun um, or whatever. Let's go. Okay, let's get into... ATP. So what you've got to ask yourself is what do you know about ATP? Okay. Um, what does the T stand for? That's tri. Uh, what does tri mean? It means three. So triphosphate, there are three phosphates. And if we look over here, you'll see that ATP is actually made up of a group called adenine. Ring any bells? It should do. DNA, RNA, you might remember there are four different bases in DNA um, and there's four different ones in RNA as well. So you re might remember that they contain adenine but they could also contain thymine or uracil if you're um, RNA and you also can have guanine as well and cytosine. But ATP just contains the base called adenine. So ATP contains a base. It also contains a pentose sugar, just like DNA and RNA contains a pentose sugar. That means there are five carbons in this sugar. However, this sugar is a ribose sugar, written down there. And ribose sugars found in RNA, but not DNA. Do you remember the name of the sugar found in DNA? It is a pentose sugar, but it's deoxyribose. So it's not a ribose sugar. And then we have phosphate groups. Now, in DNA and RNA, there is only one phosphate group attached. But in ATP, we've got three phosphate groups attached. Okay, so there's a difference there. What do we call these small molecules, or what type of monomer, as it says over here, therefore, is ATP? I've kind of refrained from using the word when talking about RNA and DNA, but you should remember what type of molecule, what is the small molecule that DNA or RNA are made up of? Okay, you got it. Nucleotides. Well done. Boom! <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's move on. What is the role of ATP in the body? Do you remember what ATP does in the body? So uh, ATP is an energy transfer molecule. Some people call it the energy currency of the body. Um, we'll talk about in a minute why it's so good at being an energy transfer molecule. But essentially... Energy, which is our ability to do work, so lift my mobile phone, nice pink colour, uh, lift my mouse or my headphones, or even just to think or move my fingers, any of this requires energy. Anytime all living things need energy. And ATP is the simplest chemical format for that energy in biological things. We call it the energy currency or the energy transfer molecule. I nearly fell off my chair then. Where's my water? Okay, water's really important as well. Without water, I wouldn't be able to access the energy from ATP, but we'll come on to that in a minute. What similarities are there between ATP and a DNA nucleotide? Well, we already mentioned we have a base here, adenine. You can find that in some DNA. Uh, 
you'll always find it on a DNA molecule, but different nucleotides might not contain adenine. They might have cytosine or guanine or thymine. Um, there's also some other similarities. They both contain a pento sugar, but DNA doesn't have it isn't a ribose sugar, so that's not a similarity. And of course, they both contain phosphate groups. However, nucleotides of DNA do not have three phosphate groups, just one. Let's roll. This is the simple diagram you can use for drawing an ATP molecule. Looks a bit similar to the DNA and RNA nucleotides. Um, Adenine here, normally shown by a rectangle, joint to the sugar, ribose, and then we've got three phosphate groups. You can flip that molecule around the other way. It can rotate any way you want, uh, but that's the order that they appear in. If I flip it that way, you'll find the phosphates on the left as you look at it, and the adenine on the right, and the ribose always in the middle. Um, so instead of drawing this horrible thing here with the P and the four O's around it, um, we can just put a P in a circle. So most of the time in biology, you can do that. I wonder how many times I say, um, in the video, but there we go. Right, where does the energy get released from ATP? So this question here is basically saying, how does ATP release energy? Well, when ATP breaks down into ADP, anyone guess what ADP stands for? If ATP stands for adenosine, triphosphate what do you think a um, DP stands for yeah adenosine diphosphate yeah well done if you got that so adenosine diphosphate and of course you can get a, a nucleotide of ATP although it's not ATP, we can get a nucleotide that only contains one phosphate, and that's called AMP. What do you think AMP stands for? What's the uh, abbreviation for just one in biology? Sorry, I muted myself. Well, it's adenosine monophosphate. The M stands for mono. You absolutely smashed it. Well, you did if you got that right. But anyway, uh, the most common one you're coming across is ATP. And if we break one of these P's off, so we break that bond, energy is released. And um, that's because unusually most reactions in the world, about 90% of all reactions are exothermic. And of course, the hydrolysis of ATP turning ATP... So this reaction is a really important one for you to know. If we take ATP and we hydrolyze it, now it is a reversible reaction, but if I hydrolyze it into ADP that I have down here, um, plus PI, and this is an important reaction for you to know. What does PI stand for? Um, you could it stands for inorganic phosphate. So when the phosphate's on its own, we say it's inorganic. It's no longer part of a biological molecule so um, it's an inorganic ion now ATP ADP plus the phosphate group so um, that reaction there is what do we call reactions that release energy GCSE chemists well done give yourself a round of applause exothermic reactions so if we go that way energy is released just like most of these things. But if you form ATP, it's highly endothermic because, of course, when we make ATP, ATP is a store of energy. So we put lots of energy in and that makes it endothermic when we go that way and exothermic when we go that way. Put your hands under your armpits. You can feel heat. Well, I can. If I put my hands under my armpits, I can feel heat. That's the heat being released from all those ATP molecules being broken into ADP plus PI because it's an exothermic reaction. So is the organic phosphate uh, positively or negatively charged? So is this organic phosphate down here positively or negatively charged? Well, it's got a negative charge. Um, all those oxygens around it 
uh, give it a negative charge. And actually, you can see these three little red circles. If you remember from GCSE chemistry, uh, these are actually representing electrons, extra electrons these oxygens have uh, hanging about. So this has a minus three charge. So it's negatively charged. And later on, is that important in AS, the first year of um, biology A level? Not not super important. Later on, the the negative charge of the phosphate group will um, you'll need to understand that it's negatively charged, and you will see the application of that in certain things like electrophoresis, which is part of DNA analysis. Okay. Something else to mention here with ATP. So ATP is our energy transfer molecule, just reminding everyone. What do you notice here that's a little bit odd? When we name ATP, what do we call these three sections again? Well, let's run through it again, see if you can memorize these three sections of the ATP molecule. So we've got one section here, one section here, and one section here. And ATP is a nucleotide. But what do we call the three separate bits? Okay, let's go through that. So the three separate bits, we have a base, a sugar, a ribose sugar specifically, and we have phosphate groups. So well done if you got those right. You absolutely smashed it. Okay, however, you might notice um, if we give them their specific names, there's something here that's a little unusual. We've got adenine, we've got, we got our sugar, ribose, and ba -ba 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 -ba, when I can finally get there, we've got phosphate group right here. What's that say? Grup up. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Okay, so what's unusual about the name? It's not adenine triphosphate. And believe me, you will lose marks in an A-level exam if you call it adenine triphosphate. It's adenosine triphosphate. So why do they call it adenosine triphosphate and not adenine triphosphate? Well, the reason is that when we combine a ribose group with an adenine base, these together are called adenosine okay and that's called a nucleoside if you contain adenine and a, 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 if you contain a base and a ribose sugar so RNA contains adenosine as well or can do when it has an adenine group attached to its ribose it would also have an adenosine group you'll never have to say that but DNA nucleotides will never have an adenosine group because they have deoxyribose so we call adenine bonded to a ribose adenosine so when we name this it's adenosine diphosphate or adenosine triphosphate not adenine triphosphate even though they contain adenine okay that's got me confused right Hope that all makes sense. So before we move on, um, ba -ba 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 uh, yeah, right. Let's rock. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. One second, peeps. Bear with me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just uh, getting my chat up. Um, hiya, is this for OCR exam board? Um, yeah, 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 no problem. Good, 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 Yoshi. Well done on your grades. Um, yeah, some of this is for the OCR exam board. Yeah, you have to know about ATP and ADP. Absolutely, Blueberry, you've got to know about them. Only the very final part of the lesson, which is going to be on the essay, you still need to know the content for the essay, so you can still watch it if you fancy it, but you won't have to write a 25-mark essay if you're studying OCR Biology A-level, but if you're doing AQA Biology A-level, you have to do a 25-mark essay, which I'm going over right at the end of the lesson. Um, yes, ATP is all edxl ocr aqa even if you're doing international baccalaureate you need to know about atp and adp 
and you need to know about inorganic ions. You'll need to know about all of the inorganic ions um, that I'm going to talk about. I'm only going to talk about them briefly today, the inorganic ions, because it's kind of like an introduction to them that you do in the first year. And then throughout the um, A-level course, when each one appears in the relevant topic, you go into a lot more detail on them. So I'm just giving you a brief overview, which is what you do at this part. If you only take AS biology, then you'll only need to know this amount, really. So it depends whether you're doing A2 or AS, but everyone seems to do A-level um, nowadays. When um, biology first came out, people did AS as well. Okay, what does this show us here? So we've got a little screen going on here. This just shows you adenosine triphosphate breaking down into adenosine diphosphate. And when it does that, it releases energy. So remember, this part is exothermic. That's the release of energy. So ATP is really the energy carrying molecule. We always think, oh, you need glucose for energy. Glucose is needed to make ATP. ATP is the final energy carrying molecule in our body. Um, some people call it the energy currency of the body. Um, if you do that, you need to put quotations. Um, but yeah, it's the energy carrying molecule within the body. It, it's a very good molecule, good at doing what it does, which I'll talk about in a second. Anyway, that just shows you the breakdown. What do we call those reactions? Can you remember what we call the reactions where we use water to break something down? It's a very specific type of reaction we use in biology where we use water to break something down and if you can remember what that's called it's called hydrolysis reactions hydro stands for water and then lysis means breaking down <laughs> Yeah, so give yourself a clap on the back if you remember that it's hydrolysis reactions. And then you've got the opposite of hydrolysis. When we want to make ATP, we take the glucose from our food and during respiration, aerobic respiration, we convert the glucose from our food and we take the energy and we store it within the bond that's formed between the phosphate and the ADP to form ATP. So this is a highly endothermic reaction which is an energy going in reaction. And um, can you remember the name of the reaction where energy is put, uh, sorry, where water molecules are used to form a bond and make a bond? Well, give yourself a clap on the back if you remember that that kind of reaction is known as a condensation reaction. You absolutely smashed it. Yeah, so basically, condensation reactions in biological molecules, OCR, AQA, EdXL, whatever exam board you do, condensation reactions make bonds, and they are for making bigger molecules from smaller ones. So ATP is bigger than ADP, has extra bonds, so they're being made by condensation. And hydrolysis is when you break bonds. And in this case, the hydrolysis of ATP releases energy for us to do all the things we need to do that require energy. Okay, final bit on ATP. I've got some notes here. Um, again, if you're watching this on a rewind, you can pause and take those notes down if you want to. Um, ATP is a nucleotide. Um, it's the energy supplying molecule in all known living things. So every single thing that's alive, except viruses, of course, which most scientists don't they, they call them acellular. They're not made of cells. and They describe them as not alive. But um, yeah, all the living things we've come across so far use ATP as the energy carrying molecule. It's like all living things don't have DNA. There are some that have RNA as their genetic code. Some have, most have DNA, but there are lots of living things with RNA as their genetic code as well. But no living thing has a choice over what's the energy molecule. All living things carry ATP as, it's, as their energy molecule, from bacteria to fungi to plants, protoctists or protists, however you want to say it. Um, and what do we need them for? Anabolic reactions. What do we need ATP or energy for? Well, we need them for anabolic reactions. Anabolic means making. 
So whenever you take amino acids and you form peptide bonds to make proteins or polypeptides, or you take glucose and you join them together to make glycogen, when you take small molecules, monomers, and turn them into polymers, those are known as anabolic reactions and building reactions. That requires ATP. Muscle contraction requires ATP. Just seen a spelling mistake. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, man. Oh, let's just give up on that. There's supposed to be a C there in contraction, so watch out for that. Uh, muscle contraction. When you squeeze your muscles, you need ATP. It requires energy. And the active transport of minerals and ions and stuff around your body in various processes, um, the active transport of nitrate ions into the roots of plants, all of that requires ATP. They're just some of the things. And adenosine can be phosphorylated to become... AMP, adenosine monophosphate, diphosphate or triphosphate. ATP is a nucleotide made of a base sugar and phosphates. Yep, we've covered that. Um, we've covered the difference between adenine and adenosine. Um, why is it a good energy molecule? It's very simple. It requires one enzyme to snap that bond and break it down and release that energy. To go from ATP to ADP only requires one en enzyme. And that's called ATPase. So that makes it a useful molecule. You wouldn't want an energy carrying molecule to require three processes to release the energy. You want the energy to be released easily. So that's a good thing. ATP is also soluble. Again, would you want an insoluble energy molecule? Um, maybe for storage, for long term storage. But if you need energy quickly for squeezing your muscles and doing stuff, then it needs to be soluble so it can be transported. So all of these things, it's easily hydrolyzed. It's recyclable. When we've broken ATP down into ADP plus PI, we can turn it back to ATP to be used again. And another bonus, when ATP breaks down and releases uh, that phosphate group, that uh, P, as you see here, the P's with the O's, they can be stuck on another molecule. And when you add a phosphate to another molecule, it makes that molecule reactive. So we can we can use ATP to release energy, but also, also to make other reactions occur by adding the phosphate to them. And ATP is made in two ways within the body. Um, it's made via something called phosphorylation. That's a mouthful. So it's made by phosphorylation. Um, which is simply by adding phosphate to ADP. And that happens in uh, respiration in something called the Krebs cycle. You'll learn about that later. Don't stress yourself. And glycolysis. Um, don't worry about that. And it also occurs in a second way by something called chemi, chemi osmosis. What does that mean? You might remember what osmosis was the transfer of. Can you remember what um, osmosis was the transfer of? Hopefully you can. Osmosis is the transfer of water or the movement of water from a what concentration? A high concentration to a low concentration across what? Across a membrane. Boom! <laughs> yeah, if you can remember all that from GCSE, well done. So, um, so what's the similarity here? Why is it called chemiosmosis and not just osmosis? This is a process of making ATP. One of the ways is by chemiosmosis. It's not actually using water, so that's why it's called chemical osmosis. It's using other chemicals other than water. It goes from high to low, and it happens across a membrane. So the, it has some similarities with normal osmosis, but it doesn't use water molecules. Right, if I was just summarizing what you had to know about ATP, short, 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 I would let me shrink this bit of information down. You can always copy that. You can always rewind. Um, yeah, so my summary of ATP, if you just had to remember a couple of things from today's lesson, ATP is an energy transfer molecule. It's made by the condensation reaction when we join ADP and PI together. PI stands for phosphate, by the way. I know, why not PH? Why not PO? Well, there we go. Uh, the I stands for inorganic phosphate. It's a nucleotide, so it has similarities between RNA and DNA nucleotides the small molecules that make up the polymers there and it contains the base adenine which is a ribose sugar and three phosphate groups 
ATP is not actually a, a, a monomer because um, ATP doesn't form a polymer. So if I said that earlier, okay, because it doesn't m turn into a polymer, but it is a nucleotide, the same as the monomers of DNA and RNA. Just clearing that up. Okay, coolio, coolio, coolio. What have I got going on here? I don't even know what these diagrams are about. Right, that's just saying... Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so I've got an RNA nucleotide here. I've got ATP down here and then a DNA nucleotide. So we can see the differences physically with these diagrams. RNA can contain adenine and ribose. That's the exact same as ATP. The only difference between these two guys here is that ATP has three phosphates. Okay. And if I look over here at DNA, there's a few more differences. Uh, it's still got adenine. It still has a five uh a pentagon there, which stands for a pento sugar, but it's not ribose. So that's a difference. And it only has one phosphate again. So there's some differences, but lots of similarities there. And they love nice, simple questions about the differences and similarities. OK, that's the end of the ATP. We're moving on. Let's get on with inorganic ions. And the first one we're going to look at. And again, we to check my mic I keep thinking I'm on mute the first one we're going to look at is um, Fe2 plus ions um, yeah Fe2 plus inorganic ions so um, where do we find iron in our body well of course that's a piece of the metal iron here. That's an anvil, an ancient anvil, something people used to make swords and shields with. And that's made out of solid iron. You can see it's uh, got a bit red-brown. It's rusted a bit. But we don't have iron, the metal, in our body. We don't have the metal iron in our body. We have Fe2+, and that's different. That's an ion. That is a charged particle. So it's slightly different. Um, and... You're going to find these Fe2 plus ions in your blood, okay? So inside your red blood cells, you have a chemical, a protein called hemoglobin, and it has a quaternary structure. This protein, which is hemoglobin, is made up of four different chains of amino acid, four polypeptides, and um, their three-dimensional shape obviously helps them bind with oxygen. But what's the role of the Fe2 plus in this? So let's have a little look. So if we get in over here and have a little look at this molecule, you'll see here it's made up of four chains. Got one there, one here, one here. Each of these represents a polypeptide, a protein. And they've got a three-dimensional shape. And this allows them to hold these iron atoms, although they're not really atoms, they're actually iron ions. So they have the symbol Fe2+. Um, and we call this polypeptide containing the iron in the middle, we call it a heme group. Now, you might notice also there's two symbols there, beta and alpha. That's just for the different polypeptides. You don't need to know that there are alpha and beta chain polypeptides in hemoglobin but it's a little extra thing you can know um what are these heme groups for what is the fe2 plus for well each fe2 plus and there are four of them in one hemoglobin protein molecule each one combined with an oxygen molecule so that means that one hemoglobin molecule can pick up four oxygen molecules eight oxygen atoms in total four oxygen molecules and why is it that iron is so important in this? Well, Fe2 plus can become Fe3 plus. You might remember in the middle of the periodic table, there was a group of metals from your GCSE days called the transition metals. And they can turn themselves from one ionic charge or one electric charge to another. So they, they don't rely on just having one charge. They can actually go from being Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. And because of that, this allows them to carry out two jobs. They can not just pick up the oxygen, but they're happy to change again and give the oxygen away. And that's very important. If we had an ion that only picked up oxygen 
and couldn't give it away, then that wouldn't be very good because it means the blood would carry the oxygen but couldn't release it to cells for respiration. So we need a, an, an ion that can pick up oxygen and release it. And it does this when it changes its electric charge. So that's just why iron, oh, it gets very confusing, iron, ion, iron, ion, yeah. That's why it's uh, really important in your body. You might remember there's a illness. If you don't get enough iron in your body, in your diet, you can suffer from something called anemia, where you get very low energy. And it's not surprising because you can't carry oxygen around your body very efficiently if you don't have a lot of iron. And you get iron in your diet through red meat. Some people are vegetarian. You can also get it from certain vegetables like spinach, um, normally really dark green red vegetables like broccoli and stuff contain a lot of iron. Um, so, a little bit of information here if you want to get this down for notes or anything. Um, this is hemoglobin. It's known as a globular protein. That means it's soluble. Okay, so it can dissolve, which is useful because we want it to be able to dissolve. It has hydrophilic groups on the outside that enable it to dissolve. Um, it's a conjugated protein, which is means it contains other things, inorganic things. So, uh, like Fe2+. Plus. Uh, it's got non-protein groups, and they're known as heme groups. Each one here, you can see spelt differently than I've spelt it there. One's the American spelling, that's the English spelling. Does it matter which you use? No, they're both correct. Each of the four polypeptide chains contains a heme group with Fe2 plus at its center. Fe2 plus can bind to oxygen, and in doing so, it becomes Fe3 plus. Great. And then it can turn back to Fe2 plus and release the oxygen. So, uh, what is it called when Fe2 plus becomes Fe3 plus? A little extra from your GCSE chemistry days. Um, if you've gone from 2 plus to 3 plus, you've lost an electron. Do you remember this, the terminology oil rig? What does that mean? So, um, if you got that right, well done. Uh, oil rig. If you lose an electron from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, you've been oxidized. Boom! So, well done if you got that right. Uh, why can Fe3 plus not bind with oxygen? Well, it doesn't have any oxygen, uh, it doesn't have any electrons left because it just gave one away. So, Fe3 plus can't pick the oxygen up. Um, it becomes Fe3 plus when it has the oxygen, but it can't pick up any more oxygen after that. So, each iron can only bind to one oxygen. Okay. Uh, oh, hold on a minute. One thing I just want to show you, just to give you uh, a little look at... Bum, bum, bum. It would help if... I talked about hemoglobin in the last uh, picture being a quaternary protein. It has a quaternary structure. And what this means is that the hemoglobin molecule is made of four different chains of protein, all wrapped together in a three-dimensional shape. So, um, yeah, that's important in its job. Some proteins only have a tertiary structure, um, but others have the quaternary structure when they contain more than one polypeptide. Okay, let's look at hydrogen ions. Why are hydrogen ions important? What's this picture about here? What is pH? I've been doing that in my chemistry lessons. pH is the uh, log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So kind of like the power of hydrogen, you can think of that P standing for. So um, yeah, hydrogen ions are really important. They're going to affect the pH of your blood. They're going to affect the pH of your cells if they're in your cytoplasm. So it's very important that the pH is maintained as some proteins lose that quaternary shape or that tertiary structure, the 3D shape, if they're in the wrong pH. So hydrogen ions play a really important role in the body in maintaining the pH, the acidity level. And you can see here I've got a little image of an enzyme um, being denatured over here and this substrate not fitting into the enzyme anymore because it's in the wrong pH. Um, hydrogen ions also play a really key role. Talking, going back to the blood, they play a really key role in maintaining the pH of the blood. And it's actually the hydrogen ions that cause the oxygen to be released from the heme groups. And what happens is 
in your muscles when you're working out you produce carbon dioxide by respiration that carbon dioxide diffuses into your red blood cells mixes with water and forms an acid called carbonic acid which releases its hydrogen ions and they tell the red blood cells to release the oxygen so although they're not consciously talking to each other they don't have a conversation your cells and your blood as it moves past if your cells need more oxygen how do they let the blood know well there's an unconscious chemical process happening that's sending a message and they do that because as carbon dioxide is the waste gas it diffuses into the red blood cells forms this carbonic acid which increases the rate the amount of hydrogen ions in the red blood cell and it's that that triggers the release of oxygen so it's a really clever way of our aspiring cells that are making carbon dioxide saying look I need more oxygen uh, hydrogen ions uh, also play key roles in plants in like mass transport in the active loading of the companion cell you'll do that when you study mass transport um, and they play a key role in something I mentioned earlier in the production of ATP through chemiosmosis without hydrogen ions in chemiosmosis moving through the ATPase we wouldn't make ATP in oxidative phosphorylation in respiration again you're going to learn about respiration in a lot of detail in your second year of a level and the role that hydrogen ions play in chemiosmosis okay now moving on you do need to know about sodium ions and again i'm going to be brief here but you'll learn in a lot of detail about sodium ions and sodium ions play a really big role in the nervous system so just to remind you what the nervous system is Yee, fiddle around with my camera this is the nervous system made of the brain and spine the central nervous system surrounded by peripheral nerves sensory and motor neurons carrying electrical impulses or action potentials around your body so what's the role of the sodium ions in this sodium ions maintain something called the resting potential what does that mean they keep your nerves when your nerves are at rest it's the action of sodium ions that keep the electrical potential across the nerve the same okay um, you'll learn a lot more about that but how does it do it it pumps sodium ions outside of the cytoplasm of the nerves so those nerves in that picture there um, they'll be pumping sodium out when they're resting they pump sodium ions out now at a certain point in sending an electrical signal when we want to generate an electrical signal gates open in the membrane of those nerve cells and sodium ions rush in we call it an influx of sodium ions and it's that that creates the electrical signal they actually do something called depolarize the cell membrane and they create that electrical signal that you called at GCSE an impulse and at A level when you study the nervous system you'll call an action potential so those those little glowing beep like bolts of light you can see depicted in that image firing down the nerve cells sodium ions also over here uh, play an important role in the absorption of um, glucose into cells so in our intestines in a region called the ileum of the intestines and they work in a process called co-transport they they are actively transported out uh, creating a concentration gradient where they diffuse back in and they happen to drag the glucose molecules with them through a specific protein and again you can see this from this image if you've not studied the membrane yet the cell membrane is a complicated structure made up of many different things and sodium ions play a key role in the transport of glucose there a little bit of information here so they're needed for co-transport to aid amino acids and glucose crossing membranes and they're also important in the generation of nerve impulses and muscle contraction and fluid regulation in the body so just some roles for sodium ions as I said it's more of a brief overview today's lesson of the different ions which you will learn about you'll learn about like this in your lessons in your college and then you'll go into greater detail when you cover the topics where they occur like iron occurs in another topic with blood and hemoglobin okay phosphate ions you can see here they've got the negative charge remember the phosphate ions from the start of the lesson they're the things that are taken off 
of ATP to release energy and added to ADP to recycle back into ATP via condensation and hydrolysis. So they play really key roles in releasing energy in living things. In fact, all living things require phosphate to release energy. Um, why have I got a picture of this molecule here? Can you work out what this image is of? It's not the greatest image in the world, but can you work out what this molecule is supposed to be? So if you can, give yourself a clap. Yeah, that's a DNA molecule. You probably recognized it from the double helix. So pat on the back if you got that right. Well, phosphate, of course, is part of the nucleotides in DNA and RNA, which is the single stranded genetic code. Um, so it's part of both. And um, yeah, so phosphate play a key role in many different things. They also are used in reactions called phosphorylation reactions, where we make certain molecules very reactive. And there's a few notes summary here. If you want to copy those down, you might want to pause and copy those down. Although you might have to add a space between phospholipids and calcium. Oh! Okay, moving on, we got potassium ions. And not a lot to say about potassium ions. They're actually important for stimulating your appetite, making you feel hungry. Something I could probably do with a bit less potassium, but of course that would be bad because it would interfere with my nervous system. So just like sodium ions, they're a counterpart with the sodium ions in the transfer of electrical signals around our body, action potentials or impulses. And they help maintain the resting potential. I mentioned that sodium ions are pumped out, pumped, meaning actively transported out of nerve cells when they're resting, when they're chilling out. Uh, potassium ions, on the other hand, are being actively pumped into nerve cells when they're resting. So they play a role alongside the sodium ions in maintaining the resting potential of our nervous system and generating nerve impulses. Okay, oh, we got there. They activate enzymes in photosynthesis as well. So they act as like cofactors. Now we have phosphate ions. Uh, not phosphate ions. Can you remember the name of that iron? NO3 minus. What is that iron? You might recognize what it is from your GCSE days. You absolutely smashed it. Yep, I'm sure you did. Those are nitrate ions from your GCSE days. Nitrate ions. And you might remember, if you did triple GCSE biology, you might remember the disgusting cycle that involves nitrate ions. It's called the nitrogen cycle. And nitrate ions are made when we take ammonium and ammonia, when ammonia forms from decaying matter, dead things basically. And then it gets oxidized by certain bacteria in nitrification into nitrites, which is NO2, and then oxidized again into nitrates. NO3. So oxygen is being added. It's first added to ammonia, which is NH3. So you get your first bit of oxygen added to make nitrites and then added again by more bacteria to make nitrates. You go into this a lot in A2, the second year of chemistry. You revisit the dreaded nitrogen cycle and do all that horrible stuff. So um, nitrate ions are very, very important. Without nitrate ions, um, we wouldn't really get plants being able to grow. So you know, they're super important. Yeah, the nitrate ions are absorbed by active transport in the roots of plants through the root hair cells. And those nitrate ions are used by plants to make things like amino acids. And they react them with glucose um, to make amino acids. So, yeah. And then, of course, what can amino acids be made if you line them up on a ribosome? A process called transcription, we can turn them... Uh, translation, sorry, we can turn them into proteins, which are needed for growth. So without nitrate ions, plants wouldn't grow. And yeah, humans don't use, we don't take nitrate ions in. Animals don't really use nitrate ions. Um, it's mainly plants that use nitrate ions. But the plants turn it into something that we need for us to grow. They turn it into amino acids and protein. They need it for their growth and our growth as well. So without nitrate ions, we'd all be screwed in terms of we wouldn't be growing. So that wouldn't be too good. We wouldn't be able to make enzymes, antibodies, hemoglobin, or any of the other things that are made of protein. So nitrate ions are essential 
for us making proteins. Okay, a few more inorganic ions to go, nearly finished. We have hydrogen carbonate ions, okay, um, and these are made actually in your blood when, we talked about that with the haemoglobin, when a molecule called um, carbonic acid, this molecule here, and if you do A-level chemistry as well, and you've watched any of my A-level chemistry lives, you will know that acids release hydrogen ions. So carbonic acid H2CO3 breaks down and releases an H+, a hydrogen ion. It needs to do that so it can tell the red blood cell, let out the oxygen. Um, and that's part of the process. And in the process, it forms hydrogen carbonate ions. So without the formation of these hydrogen carbonate ions, we we basically wouldn't be able to release oxygen to respiring cells. So they're super important. Um, yeah, and they help maintain the pH of the blood. So they act as a buffer, these hydrogen carbonate ions. How do they act as a buffer? Well, they can pick up hydrogen ions and therefore um, stop the acidity changing too much. We also have chloride ions. Okay, so what are chloride ions actually used for? Well, you've actually got them going on right now in your mouth. Well, if you've been eating, you have anyway. So can you remember the name of the liquid in your mouth? It's saliva. And can you remember the enzyme that's in the saliva in your mouth? That's amylase. Amylase released from your salivary glands. Amylase breaks down starch. Do you remember the two types of starch? You've got amylose and amylopectin. And amylose, the amylase, sorry, the enzyme requires, let's just get rid of that video. Uh, amylose requires chloride ions in order for it to work. We say they're cofactors. So chloride ions are cofactors that help amylase work. It wouldn't work without them. So do you need chloride ions in your body? Yes, otherwise you can't digest starch, which is a fantastic energy molecule. We also need chloride ions in our body because, do you remember I just talked about the hydrogen carbonate? Um, well, we have a little problem. Those HCO3 minus molecules that we just looked at over here well once they're formed inside the red blood cell they move out now they're negative and they move out and we want to keep the electric charge of the red blood cell the same so in a process called the chloride shift when hydrogen carbonate ions move out of our red blood these chloride ions move in from our blood plasma into the red blood cells and the electric charge doesn't change. We like to keep things the same in our body. Do you remember that word, homeostasis? We like to keep internal conditions the same. So it's one of those, it helps with those. I think that's the last of the ions that I'm going through. So those are all your inorganic ions. Now, if you're doing OCR, a AQA, or Edexcel, you do need to know all that information and you'll learn in much more detail about that. It's just one of the topics in the first year is a brief overview of them. So I've given you a brief overview. I've probably delved into them even in more detail than you actually need. Now, um, ooh, one more. <sighs> yeah, just so many of these. Oh, jeez. I thought there was only one. Say when. Round one. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you remember? Uh, I had hydrogen ions with a pH picture. Why have I got hydroxide ions with the pH picture? What do hydroxide ions do to your pH of your cytoplasm in your cells, or your blood, or your blood plasma? your fluid, your tissue fluid, what would hydroxide ions do? Well, hydroxide ions, because they've got a minus, they can soak up H+, the hydrogen ions, turn it into water, and they can kind of neutralize the acidity of the hydrogen ions. Or if you've got more hydroxide ions about, they can make it 
less alkaline, well, more alkaline, sorry, less acid. They take out the hydrogen ions and decrease the amount of hydrogen ions around. And that increases your pH, moves it up more from the acid pHs of 1 to 6 towards 8 to 14. So they change your pH. And of course, pH is super essential in things like... Um, action of proteins with their three-dimensional structure. Things like the active site of enzymes will denature in the wrong pH. Okay. Oh, my good gosh. I thought that was it. This is definitely the final ion we have to know about. And we do have to know about calcium. Okay. So, um, what have we got to know about calcium, he says. Da, 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 da. Well... Calcium is a metal in group two of the periodic table. If you can remember, kind of picture your periodic table in your head, it's in the second group. And what color are metals? Well, they're not all silver, but calcium is a silver metal, just like other ones. So um, we know that calcium's in our bones. So why is it that our bones don't look silver if we've got calcium in them? Well, it's because we don't have calcium metal in its metallic form in our body it's in another form it's in the form of calcium phosphate and group two metals if you're a chemist when they're bonded to anything to make a compound they make a white color hence calcium phosphate is what gives our bones our teeth the white color so a, a compound of calcium is found in our body and it's an ionic compound and so it contains calcium 2 plus ions. So they are very important in the formation of bones. Um, you might remember over here uh, what this diagram represents. You might have seen that at GCSE or you might be reviewing your A-level stuff. So what part of the body is this? It's found in our nervous system. Can you remember what that diagram is of that I've just been highlighting there? And if you can, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely smashed it. Okay, yeah, that will be because that is the synaptic cleft. That is the synapse. At A level, we call the gap between them the synaptic cleft. And if you can remember that, then you seriously are a... <laughs> yeah, you're a cool dude if you can remember that. Or a cool dudette. Yeah. What happens? As the electrical signal um, reaches, ba, 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 ba. so as we get an electrical signal called an electrical impulse, but at A level, we like to call it an action potential. As the action potential reaches the end of one of the neurons, like your sensory neuron, what happens is calcium ions, um, this electrical signal stimulates a gate to open here, shown in blue. Um, on the side here and calcium ions flood into the end of the neuron. These calcium ions call these little bubbles, these circles or spheres that are known as vesicles to diffuse or move towards the end of the membrane and fuse with it the end of the nerve and they then release the chemical inside. Do you remember the name of the chemicals that cross the synapse? They diffuse across the synapse but they've got a special name. So you might remember the name of those chemicals. Um, well done if you do. They're known as neurotransmitters. You absolutely smashed it. Yeah, that's neurotransmitters. And they move across that gap and fuse to special protein receptors on the other side. And that's when our sodium ions become involved. Remember I said sodium ions were involved. And they depolarize the membrane and form another action potential. So calcium ions, if we didn't have calcium ions in our body... We couldn't send electrical signals because they couldn't cross the synapse. It's the calcium ions that allow the chemicals, the neurotransmitter, to cross the synapse. And why have I got someone doing a bicep shot? <laughs> well, because calcium ions are also involved in muscle contraction. They help with um, ATP to stimulate the formation of ATP. And remember we said we need ATP to squeeze our muscles. And they also calcium ions they help with um other parts 
of muscle contraction as well. So they're really important. Um, without calcium ions, we wouldn't have a skeleton, so we'd find it hard to move. And we wouldn't be able to move that skeleton because we wouldn't have be able to squeeze our muscles, and we wouldn't be able to send electrical signals around our body. So life would be a real bummer without calcium ions. So they're needed in muscle contraction, transmission of nerve impulses, the release of insulin from your pancreatic cells. Do you remember what insulin's involved in? The regulation of glucose and in bone formation. And they're also a cofactor in several enzymes. Remember, I used the, the example of chloride ions with amylase. Well, calcium ions are another cofactor. Right. Couple of exam questions, dudes. And then I am done because uh, this was supposed to be brief, but I like to chat so much that nothing's ever brief. Right. Ready for some exam questions. Let's do it. Say when. Round one. Let's go. All right. So exam questions. Let's do it. Um, what property of iron allows them to carry out their function in red blood cells? What was it about iron um, that enables them to do their job? Well, Iron can form Fe2+, plus, so that would get you a mark, if you remember that iron is Fe2+, plus when it's in the red blood cells. And here, are, here is our lovely answer. So, iron can form Fe2+, plus or Fe3+. Plus. You could say it's polar. It's part of a heme group. It's found in the heme group, and it can pick up oxygen. So, if you said it's Fe2+, plus or Fe3+, plus and it picks up oxygen, there you go, because that's its job. Um, it forms oxyhemoglobin and transports oxygen. So these are all possible answers. You only need two of those to get two marks. So, uh, yeah, well done. Right. The next thing. Oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, give yourself a pat on the back. Now, next question. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Okay, describe the role of sodium and phosphate ions. So, we just need to do a brief thing. What were sodium ions used for in the body? Pause the video if you're watching on a read one and see if you can recall. And what are phosphate ions used for? So if we're describing the role of sodium ions, we can just say, well, they're used in the transmission of impulses or maintaining the resting potential in the nervous system, in nerve cells. We can also mention that sodium ions are involved in the transport of glucose or amino acids in digestion. It's called co-transport because they work together with glucose or amino acids to transport into the epithelial cells of the ileum. Now, um, phosphate ions, what's their job? Well, we talked about phosphate ions. Where do you find those? You remember from the start of the lesson, they're found in ATP. So without phosphate ions, we couldn't form ATP. So they're also used in something called phosphorylation, where we make molecules more reactive. Um, phosphate ions are also found in your DNA nucleotides or RNA nucleotides. So let's have a look at the answers here. Uh Lots of answers there. So there's four different ones for sodium. So for sodium, we could say co-transport underline. They love that word of glucose or amino acids. Uh, sodium moved out by active transport. Uh, sodium diffusion gradient. They affect the osmosis of water. Phosphate uh, found in nucleotides, DNA, RNA, uh, used to make ATP to phosphorylate compounds. Oh, found in the phosphate cycle. Okay, coolio. Right, guys, this is just for AQA people. Um, basically, there's a synoptic essay. Synoptic. Basically, it draws on your information for, that you've learned throughout the course. And what's going to happen is, at the end of your very final biology exam, if you were an AQA student, your paper three is feared by all students for one thing. 
uh, it should be feared for lots of things because it contains a lot of practical write-ups. You need to have revised all your practicals and it also contains quite a lot of application questions. So not a lot of memorizing content. Um, but the biggest thing that students fear is the 25 mark essay that's right at the end of um, the paper. Yeah, that's right. You'll get a choice of two different essays. Let me just move my face. So you'll get a choice of two different essays, uh, but you're going to have to do and write one 25 mark essay. I can't handle the stress no more, dog. These damn A levels. Yeah, unfortunately, you're just going to have to get over it. And what I would say, 90% of the students that I come across, they... And 90% of the schools and colleges do this as well. And it's a big, big mistake. They basically get to the third year. They're so busy, the schools and colleges, teaching the content that they wait until six months before the final exam. Or some schools wait till three months before. And they go, ah, we need to work on the essays. Well, the essays take time to get really good at. Okay, And you need to work on the essays from the start of the course. So... As you're covering each topic, as you work through your A-level course, if you want to get an A-star in biology, you need to be thinking, oh, I could get an essay about this topic. How would I put together an essay about this topic? Right Now, um, there are a list of like 30 essays that AQA have asked over the last sort of 10 years or 15 years. As they asked two per exam, that would be 15 years, right? Um, and some of the essays crop up more than others. So there's been one on inorganic ions, which we've just done today. There's been an essay, and these are the three essays that I came across going back 15 years looking at all the exam papers that involve the word ions. So we've got one that says here, write an essay on the importance of biological ions, 25 marks. Write an essay on the importance of ions in metabolic processes. So specifically metabolic processes. Um, and then the third one, a bit of a longer title, inorganic ions include those of sodium, phosphorus and hydrogen. Write an essay on how these and other organic ions are used in living things. So really, um, they all say the same thing. They just want you to talk about ions. The third one says you've got to talk about those three and then include another. Now, when you're doing the synoptic essay, you've got to talk about content from at least three or four different areas of the book. So you have to draw on four separate topics. They can come under the same unit. So you can draw on things that are all in biological molecules, but they've got to be different concepts, different topics around different things. So and so you want to kind of pick four different fields to pick your marks to get all 25 marks. And if you want to access 20 to 25 marks, the final bit of that, you need to... Um, if you want to access the last five marks of the essay, you need to write something that's beyond the specification, beyond the curriculum. So what they mean by that is extra learning that's not in your book. What I highly recommend, right, is if you know the AQA content, what you can do is you have your opposite exam board like AQA, OCR or Edexcel. You'll find there's some bits, some paragraphs of writing that OCR students need to know that AQA don't and vice versa. So there's little bits of information that are found in one course and not in the other. Guess what? If you include one of those paragraphs in your 25 mark essay and it's relevant, i.e. don't start talking about the Premier League if the question's on badminton. So... If it's relevant to your question, so if it's about inorganic ions, but it's something that's found in OCR, but not AQA, you can use it to get your your marks, basically. That's a beyond the specification point. So that's one of the things. The other thing I'm going to do in a series of videos throughout the years, it gets close to the end of the year into the exam. I'm going to cover lots of useful material that you can actually use in many different essays. So you only have to learn about five paragraphs of extra content and some of those paragraphs you can you could use in five different essay titles so they you you're able to use that content in many different essay titles and of course I'll be in contact with my contacts to try and get an inkling 
of what SA is going to come up for this year, for the year 13s this year? Agent Harris, I have the predicted papers from Let's, Let's Get, get to, to the Marks. marks. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Uh, let's go. Right. Let's move on. I'm just going to quickly whip through this. So kind of like what these essays, you can pick any four of the irons I've talked about and um, you'd need to go into more detail. So if you're only in the first year of A level, you probably won't understand a lot of the detail that would be needed for this because you have got to spend about 40 to 45 minutes on this essay. It's a 25 mark essay and the exam board recommend 40 to 45 minutes. So you want to plan it out. You want to think about, right, what ones, what do I know a lot about? Oh, do I know a lot about hydrogen ions, sodium ions, calcium ions, iron, phosphate, nitrates, um, hydroxide ions? What ones do I have the most knowledge on? Once you come across those, you're then going to pick four and write a paragraph of detailed A-level information. You will score no marks for GCSE content. Okay, And with your extra syllabus stuff, it can't be GCSE level. It has to be a level standard. All right. Now, this is just a quick thing. Basically, throughout the year, I'm going to do 25 essays this year in lives. But I'm just going to put the information up there. And you can try and learn them or read through them. And they're going to score you 20 to 25 marks, those essays um, of content. You can always make them a lot better. Unless I have a limited amount of time. I'm, just like, I'm not going to spend 45 minutes. But essentially, going to give you the brief overview. So I've got something here. My first paragraph on hydrogen ions. Now, it used to be thought and it used to be AQA policy that when writing an essay, you had to link your paragraphs. So I've got five sections in this essay and it used to be thought that you had to link them. And I'll talk about that a bit later, but many YouTubers of the prominent sort of um, biology A-level YouTubers that are online and stuff have said they've written to the exam board and the exam board has said you don't need to, the paragraphs don't have to be linked. Um, they have to be, all be relevant to the question and you have to highlight that. And I always say, refer back to the question. So if it's why is this important, keep using the word it is important because and that way you're constantly linking back to the question. If you don't write that, you'll very quickly find yourself waffling about stuff that's nothing to do with the question. So, um, yeah. So here we go. We've got hydrogen ions are transferred. So this is just about hydrogen ions and it's just giving you the kind of information you would want about hydrogen ions. So it's really talking about their role in respiration and glycolysis and about how hydrogen ions are used in the transfer of electrons and they're used in chemiosmosis. And if we didn't have hydrogen ions to do that chemiosmosis that I mentioned earlier, we wouldn't be able to get the ATPase to spin as the hydrogen ions go through it. And we wouldn't be able to get it to join ADP to the inorganic phosphate and to make ATP. So you always want to be saying like, what if they've asked you why is this important you want to say what would happen if it wasn't there that's my thinking you always want to say like well hydrogen ions are important because they do this and if they weren't there then this wouldn't happen so that's kind of really key that you're linking back to that um they're needed in the light independent reaction in chemiosmosis and they're needed in respiration in oxidative phosphorylation so you really want to hammer the detail there I've put a little bit of the detail here you really want to make it a level detail we sp talk specifically about a level molecules you've learned about and processes like hydrogen ions are released from photolysis in the light independent reaction and then we want to use the words like NADP and NADP reduced okay um and we want to say that basically if we didn't have hydrogen ions, we couldn't make ATP. And therefore, if we couldn't make ATP, we wouldn't be able um, to turn glycerate 3-phosphate GP into triose phosphate TP. And therefore, in photosynthesis, you wouldn't be able to make molecules like glucose. So the whole purpose, of, the whole of photosynthesis, the whole end result, which is to make a glucose molecule or another complex organic molecule, that could not happen without hydrogen ions in chemiosmosis making the ATP that goes on to turn the GP into TP. So yeah, those of you that have studied photosynthesis and respiration will know what I'm on about. But that's the kind of paragraph you want on hydrogen ions. Now, um, like I said, we used to link, and I'll talk about that. So if my next um, inorganic molecule has anything to do with hydrogen ions, I could find a link 
to that one. So um, my next paragraph is on sodium. But if my inorganic molecule, my next one to talk about was iron 2 plus, Fe2 plus, I could talk about the hydrogen ions moving into red blood cells and them causing the Fe2 plus ions or the ion to release the oxygen in the unloading of oxygen. So that would be a link now for me to jump in and talk about Fe2+. But AQA have said you don't have to do that anymore. It's still good practice, I suppose. It'll make your essay sound really cool if you can link each paragraph like that with one sentence that goes from hydrogen ions to Fe2 plus ions and so forth. But you don't have to. Okay, sodium over here. Okay, so I've got some information here. Again, if you wanted, you could copy this down or you could memorize this. Or this is just to give you the, if you're doing, if you're in your A2, your year 13, and you're studying for your essay, this is the kind of thing you want to now bust out on your next iron. So you just want to talk about four different irons and you need that level of detail. And we want to keep reminding the examiner why we know it's important. We don't want to just talk about sodium. We have to say why it's important. So it needs to maintain the resting potential and you can talk about the three sodium ions out, the two potassium in. We can talk about the sodium gates opening when they're stimulated, like if they're voltage gated, they're open when voltage occurs and the sodium ions move in. Some of them like Pacinian corpuscles, they have like um, baro um, receptors. They're going to open their sodium gates when there's a pressure on them. And when the sodium gates open, we get an influx of sodium ions into the cell and that depolarizes. Well, if it crosses the threshold of minus 55 millivolts, then all the sodium gates will open and all the sodium ions will move into the axon of the nerve cell, depolarizing the membrane. And that, of course, forms an action potential, an electrical impulse. So once we've said all of that, we need to highlight why it's important. Without sodium ions depolarizing the membrane, the influx of sodium ions to depolarize the membrane, we wouldn't get an action potential. And without action potentials, we wouldn't be able to send these electrical messages around our body, these action potentials that are very fast. And so, yeah, a plant can cope without a nervous system and without sodium ions and messages because it doesn't have a nervous system and it doesn't need to move fast. But you check out an animal um, that doesn't have a nervous system like you're not going to be able to function like a human does and be able to react quickly and and control your muscles in the way that we do. You're going to be a lot less efficient. So we need to point out the importance of that. Of course, um, we also have the sodium gates closing and the membrane repolarizing and we have hyperpolarization, which creates a refractory period. And without that, we wouldn't have discrete signals. So the signals wouldn't be discrete and they'd be harder to interpret for our body. And sodium ions, of course, if you don't want to talk about the nervous system bit, you could do it and, but you might be limited for time. You could talk about sodium ions in co-transport through the digestive system. And of course, sodium ions are actively transported out of the ileum's epithelial cells. They're the outer layer of cells you know, that cover the surface of the epithelium, of the ileum, your intestines, in your small intestine, part of it's the ileum, and the cells on the edge that have the villi and microvilli are the epithelial cells. Now, sodium ions are transported out of that into the blood, so not into the, and what that does creates a, a low concentration of sodium ions in those epithelial cells, and therefore, sodium moves from the lumen of the intestine into the epithelial cells. And as it does, so it's diffusing into the epithelial cells. And as it does this, it drags glucose with it across a co-transporter protein. And this is called co-transport. The glucose actually goes against its concentration gradient. So it's like indirect active transport because the sodium ions are diffusing, but the glucose is going against its gradient. But it the active transport was kind of done on the sodium ions at the start of it. So it's it's indirect active transport. Anyway, um, that's how amino acids are absorbed as well. So again, what's the importance of that? If we didn't have co-transport, then we wouldn't be able to absorb all of the glucose or a lot of the glucose that passes through our intestines and we'd be a less efficient and if you have less glucose, you're going to get less ATP from respiration. And so you're stressing the importance of the sodium ions. If you don't stress the importance and link it to the question, you're not going to, you're not going to get more than like uh, 15 marks. 
you don't do that. So you always want to be linking this stuff to the question. So my third paragraph here that I've chosen, again, you could talk about any of the ions I've talked about. Obviously, I've kind of done year 12 de depth of knowledge on those ions. You would need to go into year 13 depth of knowledge, which I have done on these ones, on these five paragraphs. So this is my third paragraph. Remember, it's best to do four paragraphs, okay, um, from four different topics, and then a fifth paragraph on your extracurricular knowledge. So when an action potential, again, I've got the nervous system here, I'd probably be tempted not to use the nervous system again here and skip that first paragraph. But if with your sodium ions, you've gone for the digestion paragraph, then you could do your calcium ions for the nervous system paragraph. It is in a slightly different topic because it's in transmission of the impulse across the synapse, but I don't want the examiner to think I'm just talking about the nervous system all the time. So um, when the action potential arrives at the presynaptic knob, A-level content, guys, uh, don't just call it the end of the neuron. When it arrives at, the, arrives at the presynaptic knob, it stimulates calcium ions channels to open and an influx of calcium ions to enter the presynaptic knob. And then they stimulate or activate the vesicles containing neurotransmitter to move towards um, the membrane and they fuse with the membrane and release the neurotransmitter by exocytosis and that neurotransmitter I would give an example of could be like acetylcholine again by saying all these key words the examiner is seeing that you've got a level content here and then they diffuse across the synapse and bind to the receptors and we get the depolarization and the of the postsynaptic membrane and we get the action potential reforming. Now when I said diffuse across the synapse that's kind of GCSE. I should say synaptic cleft to guarantee myself that A-level content there. The gap between the neurons at A-level is the synaptic cleft. The whole thing is the synapse but we call it the synaptic cleft. Now without those calcium ions we, would, we wouldn't be able to get the transmission of neurotransmitter across the gap. Now, you could say, yeah, but then screw the gaps, don't have them, just have nerves uh, going all the way around. But then what would happen is that synapse performs a role. It keeps signals unidirectional. It means they can only go in one direction. Why? Because we've only got calcium ions found on one side of the synaptic cleft. We've only got neurotransmitter on one side and we've only got the binding sites uh, for the neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic. So all of that allows it to be unidirectional. So without the calcium ions, we wouldn't get the transmission of neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft and we wouldn't be able to have unidirectional messaging. Right, um, probably if I'd been talking about sodium ions and I just talked about depolar the, the formation of action potentials using sodium ions, I'd probably use calcium ions in the context of what they do with muscles and they play a couple of important roles in muscle contraction. Um, calcium ions, they bind to a molecule called troponin, which causes the, that causes the change of shape of these molecules and it causes tropomyosin to come out of the actin myosin binding site. That's the where the myosin heads slot into the actin filaments. Remember the binding site? Well, it's the calcium ions that change the molecule that's blocking that site and allow it to be freed up so we can get an actin myosin cross bridge formed. All heavily A-level content words that are scoring you marks. Okay, um, so we can say if we didn't have the calcium ions, then we couldn't remove the troponin or the tropomyosin from the binding site and we couldn't form a cross bridge and we couldn't contract our muscles. And if we can't contract our muscles, we can't move our skeleton and this wouldn't be very good for the survival of animals. So um, yeah, muscle contraction, super important, but it needs calcium ions. Um, calcium ions also activate the enzyme ATPase that hydrolyzes ATP to ADP plus PI. Why do we need that to occur in muscles? Because it's the energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP that um, allows us to do the power stroke, which is where the myosin heads kind of ratchet forward like a crank mechanism and cause your... Uh, 
muscles to contract. You could go on about the sarcomere and stuff, but you don't want to go too off topic. Um, yeah, so what's the importance? Again, I've mentioned here, if we didn't have calcium ions, muscle tra contraction wouldn't be possible. What's the downside? We couldn't move our skeleton. Uh, not just the skeleton. We've got smooth muscle in vasoconstriction. You know, when you get hot, your um, arterioles dilate and you release more blood, uh, more heat via radiation to help you cool down. And peristalsis, when you eat food, you've got the contraction of the smooth muscle throughout your digestive system that moves food down. So we wouldn't have that. We wouldn't be able to do that, basically. Yeah. So super important. Okay. But, but, but yeah, my chat's uh, gone off. I can't read the chat at the moment. But was that three or four? I don't know. Because I don't know. Okay. This is number four. Yeah, I kind of talked about all of this already. So I'm um, not going to go too much on about this. But yeah, this is the information about why FE2 plus is useful. Um, again, like let's pretend you wanted to link. I just finished talking about calcium ions and muscles. I could now say something like muscles require oxygen to be the final electron acceptor in oxidative phosphorylation in respiration. How do we transport the oxygen to the muscles? Boom, I've done a link between muscles and calcium ions and I've linked in to the Fe2 plus ions. That's if you like to do links. AQA have said you don't have to link the paragraphs like you used to. It's a better essay if you do, but they're not going to score you more marks for linking them. It still might impress the examiner more. Um, so, Fe2 plus ion, blah, blah, blah. So, we've talked about all of that. Here is all of this. You can pause and write this all down if you like. Again, the downside is if we didn't have Fe2 plus ions and they couldn't change their state from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, then hemoglobin wouldn't be able to pick up oxygen, which we call oxygen loading or association. And it wouldn't be able to release oxygen in unloading or disassociate oxygen and release it to respiring muscles. And that would mean that it wouldn't be an effective transport um, system for transporting oxygen to respiring cells, for picking up oxygen in the lungs and dropping them off at cells. So those things are all important. Um, again, you can pause that. Again, this isn't all the information on Fe2+. Plus. I had to keep it down a little bit, but this would be enough to get you a lot of marks. Right, that's the fourth paragraph. Now comes to your... Da, 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 da. Um, okay, so you can get this down if you want. This is an extra paragraph. Um, <clears throat> yeah. On cholera. On what, how does this link to inorganic ions? Well, cholera uses chloride ions in order to give you the symptoms of cholera, like diarrhea. Um cholera uh, involves the transmission of transport of chloride ions and you can read all that stuff there this one I like to learn because this is like extra content and it fits into quite a few topics because you could use this with an essay on osmosis you could use this one with an essay on the shapes of molecules of proteins you could use this extracurricular fifth paragraph on quite a few different topics you could use it on membranes transport across membranes there's essays that have been asked on that but this one is specifically on ions i think the link with ions may be a little bit stretching it but there we go um so Essentially, this is just telling us that the cholera bacteria, if you eat dirty water from um, contaminated water, basically, um, you can get cholera, the bacteria in your body. The name of the cholera bacteria, A-level content, is Vibrio cholera. Um, really, if I write Vibrio cholera, I... I I need I could write that in the um, binomial script and that would be high level a level content um, they have a flagella you know bacteria some bacteria have like a tail a flagella and they corkscrew it spin it in a corkscrew motion so that the cholera bacteria twists and it burrows through the mucus layer of your epithelial cells in your intestines and when they get in there, they produce a toxic protein. It's actually called CTX or cholerogen or cholerogen. This toxic protein is multifunctional. So it has 
two different parts of it that have two specific different shapes that we want to talk about. One specifically shaped part, this is why it'd be good for a protein assay as well, binds to carbohydrate receptors that are only found on epithelial cells. And this, if you were talking an essay on membranes, would explain why cholera only affects the intestines and not the lungs or the heart or, I don't know, your eyeballs, because those specific receptors are only found on the epithelial cells in the intestines. So that's why cholera only affects them, um, because this toxic protein, this poisonous or toxic protein it produces, binds only to those cells. The other part of the protein, the other part, the other shape of it, and this is the bit that fits in with our ions essay, causes ion channels to open, right, in the membrane of, of the epithelium, which causes chloride ions to leave epithelial cells and flood into the lumen. The lumen is the space in your intestines, okay? It's the space inside it. Um, so it goes into the space in your intestines called the lumen, A-level content. These chloride ions, what's that going to do to the water potential? Well, simultaneously, this is going to lower the water potential of the lumen, right? Because chloride ions going in makes the water potential lower. And it's going to increase the water potential of the epithelial cells. So now the epithelial cells have lost their chloride ions. They've become a high water potential. And the lumen of your intestines has become low water potential. What's going to happen? Osmosis. You could link it to an osmosis essay, this content. The osmosis of water into the lumen, and that causes you to get the symptom of diarrhea. It makes a very watery uh, feces, which is diarrhea. Okay, and through the process of diarrhea, you lose lots of other ions that are important in your body that are sitting in your in intestines waiting to be absorbed into the blood and they get washed out with the diarrhea so you lose sodium ions potassium ions calcium ions all these other electrolytes these other ions that are really really important for all the reasons we've talked about earlier so we can stress that when we want to talk about this in an ion essay we need to stress why having diarrhea is bad because we lose all these ions therefore we lose all those functions um and specifically, the chloride ions roll, uh, the movement of the chloride ions caused by this toxic protein and the opening of these channels is what gives us this symptom of diarrhea with cholera. And we can mention the osmosis. And without chloride ion channels being affected, it wouldn't cause these symptoms of diarrhea, the cholera. So, and you wouldn't lose all these other ions. And we can, we if you get cholera. We treat it, you can prevent it by good hygiene because you have to get con drink contaminated water or have contaminated material. So basically, if sewage, if raw poo and we, feces, urine, that kind of stuff, sewage is mixing with drinking water supplies, that's what you're going to get. Um, we haven't had cholera in the UK for many, 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 many years. That doesn't mean that it won't come back. It all depends on our economy and our economic standards. So it could come back to the UK. We get with already stories this summer about various water companies dumping their overflow of sewage into the sea. Now we do treat, using treatment plants, we treat water before it gets back into the water cycle. And, you know, humans end up drinking it. We do all that treatment. But a lot of that relies on your economy and your government having enough money to be able to pay for that. The moment you lower that economy, the moment you're going to get things like cholera creeping back in. If your economy crashes, and you can't clean the water anymore in the way that you want to do via normal water treatment methods, you might start getting cholera creep back in. So anyway, oral rehydration, known as ORT, capital O, capital R, capital T, can help replace lost ions from diarrhea. And they contain things like sodium ions, potassium ions, and chloride ions. And you could sort of talk about why it's impo that's important. So this would all be extracurricular A-level stuff. Funnily enough, all of this was in the A-level spec before 2015 for AQA. So it's something that the AQA examiners know really well. They'll be like, oh, this person, they know that it's not in the curriculum anymore. And if you come out with this, you're going to get those extra marks. Um, you do need to perfect this bit with the first four paragraphs for your essays, because if you don't have all of that, then the extra content isn't going to necessarily bump you up those marks. But there you go. That's... Um, 
how to write an essay on ions. You can do it better than what I've done there. Um, but yeah, I had to smash it out for this live. Anyway, guys, I'm going to finish up the live there. And I'm going to be doing about 25 essays this year. So on some of my lives, I will end with an essay question for the biology. Others I won't, but there we go. Um, let's finish up. So thank you very, very much, guys. I am going to be out of here. So see you later. See you on the next live. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that business. And don't forget, if you're starting college, to share with friends at college. It helps me with my channel. The more people that watch, like and comment, the more ideas I'll get. The more people that say, sir, uh, could you go over this? It gives me more ideas about what people want to know about. So if there's certain specific things you want to know about to do with the A-levels and want to learn about, you know, leave a message. Nice one.